welcome to the Espresso, your daily shot of Chinese words with Catherine Xiang. I'm really pleased to have Professor George Zhang with us today in my playlist of Ming Shi Jiang Tan as the expert, where we invite experienced experts in Chinese language education to talk about their experience, their advice to our learners. So Professor Zhang, can you say hi briefly? Hi, uh, Catherine, and hi, everyone. Great, thank you so much. And I'm really honored actually to have George Zhang with us today because he's really experienced and established in the UK Chinese language education. So please first allow me to introduce Professor Zhang properly. Uh, Professor George Zhang is Professor of Chinese and Director of the Center for Modern Languages in the School of Liberal Art of the Richmond University, so the American International University in London. And he's got, as I mentioned, 30 years of really rich experience in Chinese teaching in British and Chinese university as well. And he also has a lot of experience in terms of management consultancy and training. And he got his PhD from University of Nottingham. And before joining Richmond University, Professor Zhang was director of SOAS Language Center and University of London, and also director of London Confucius Institute in the UK. He has participated and managed in a wide range of Chinese language and learning related projects. So for example, the European benchmark for Chinese language teaching. Also, he was the chair of British Chinese Language Teaching Society between 2006 and 2008. And on top of that, he is the honorary fellow of Tartet Institute of Linguists and associate researcher at a range of different organizations. And finally, I mean, I, I can go on forever. <laughs> uh, I want to also mention he has published a wide range in terms of, you know, not only Chinese textbooks, but also language policy and language learning. And I must mention, because he has many publications in terms of Chinese textbooks, but Chinese in steps, this series of books in particular has won the Outstanding International Chinese Teaching Material Award in 2010. So without further ado, uh, just as I mentioned again, Professor Zhang, so nice to have you here to share what you think is really important in terms of teaching Chinese as a foreign language. Okay, uh, morning. Okay, uh, thanks again, first of all, formally, and uh, thanks to Dr. Catherine Xiang for inviting me to be part of your program. And uh, it's also for me a quite a good honor in a way to share a few thoughts of mine and uh, during the years of my working in the learning and the teaching of languages, just the, not only Chinese. But I think obviously my major obviously is in Chinese. If I let me share my screen. And, uh, okay, and uh, thanks again, Catherine, for the very lengthy formal introduction. But I think, uh, in fact, when I, whenever actually I introduce myself, I think normally I start with two roles. First of all, I am a language learner. So the learning journey for me started years, years ago. Uh, when I first was exposed to English language when I was a kid. That was in Shanghai, actually. And uh, it was just after the kind of, uh, uh, immediately after the Cultural Revolution and uh, the government started to <coughs> decide to introduce something, but the English was very political. So it's uh, kind of, you know, and the teacher was not trained. The teacher went to the school in the evening and would teach us in the morning. So without any kind of experience knowledge about teaching English to Chinese, including the kid. And so my learning, the journey of English learning was terrible. Oh, I was no. good at all the courses, all the subjects except English, which I hated at that time. And uh, that also included when I went to the university. And uh, so because of, well, experience, and then I had to choose English over other subjects, especially math, which I was really good at. And my math teacher, I remember, still remember, he was really mad when I actually chose the English. But English was only the option I had at that time. 
And because of the limited exposure I had in, when I was working in the factory, where we had the two imported turbo machines with all English explanations. So I learned a bit of English grammar. So that's why I went to the university to study English. So it's almost fate. But again, experience was really bad, to be honest, until a couple of years later. Basically, I studied four years for my first degree. For the first two years, I couldn't really speak. Okay, now this experience helped me in a way to reflect on learning and the teaching and probably in a way prepared me later on to be a kind of a language teacher. So in a way, I'm always reflecting the process. And because of that, so I said, my first role is language learning. Personally, I think learning is never ending. You can never be expert in the language, which is very difficult, including your mother tongue. But the language learning is very telling. So the first of all is a learning. Secondly, because of what I do. So the second role I normally assigned to myself primarily is a teacher. So even today I'm still teaching. And because the teacher teaching also can really tell you a lot. So when you combine the teaching and the learning together, that's very powerful. And that is what really I advise most of the teacher would have to do. If you do not have a rich learning experience in a language, it's very difficult to understand the problems learner have of a language. Mother tongue is easy for everyone, or even the language of the similar family, which we call the language of very, not very distant, but very close. So they're quite similar. But Chinese, for many other language you know, speakers, if they learn the Chinese, they would find it's quite difficult. The same as we start to learn English. Because it was so long ago, we start to you know, tend to forget the kind of experience we had at that time. So that's number one. But as a teacher also, it's quite important in a way to understand what the language learning is about. What expectation do we have about the language learning? So when I learn the language, I my aim is to learn about a dozen of languages, but not to be able to be able to speak like a native. I can't. If you think about today, the speakers of English, okay, the non-mother tongue speakers, the non-first language speakers far out of number, the first language speaking <coughs> people. So if you think of that Chinese is going to be international language like, like, like English, I can almost you know, say for sure that the, you would have a variety of Chinese and the Chinese will be spoken in a different way. But as long as you can communicate, you can accomplish the task. And then the, this is what the language is for. Language is for communication. So if you, I mean, we are all in London, if you just go onto the street and you see how English is spoken in a variety of ways, that's what the language is about. And if you put it in a wider context in Europe, although we're just out of the European Union, but if you put it in a con context with Europe, but UK is still very a multicultural and uh, multi-linguistic kind of uh, society, especially in London, you know, where over 300 languages are spoken. So that's very important in, the in a way that for teachers to understand why we learn the language, what we teach them, okay? We, on, on the basis of that, obviously, you know, need some theory, you need some research. So, because normally I've been working, oh, well, in, in the last uh, donkey years, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the time I've been working uh, with adult learners. And when I say adult learners, in terms of language learning, I'm not talking about 18 years old who had the legal rights. We probably about 14, 15, you know, age, in the teenage time, the way you learn the language is very similar to adult anyway. So you pass what we call the critical stage in language acquisition. But dealing with this, this people based upon the experience and the research, you know, down including myself, and we devised, developed this program, uh, this project or this approach, what we call 3C approach. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about what it is about. But for the language teacher, it is also important in the European environment, also including the UK. And uh, to rethink about the role of a teacher in the classroom or in your relation to the learners. Many of us still think about we are teachers. And so as Chinese, especially the people coming from the Chinese background, we know, you know the three most important functions that the a, a teacher is expected to have. But it, when it comes to the language learning, and you know that in a kind of modern society, even today, the teacher is more like a facilitator and more importantly is a collaborator. So basically you 
and the learners collaborate to each other. But that's based upon a lot of things that probably we need to think about it. And this think leads us to very much, as I mentioned at the very beginning, a teacher, especially a conscientious language professional, you need to be actually constantly on alert and to be reflective. Experience is important. When I look back and some of the exact things I'm talking about is based upon experience, but my view is that experience is acquired over the time. So the ideas, the perceptions are far more important for as far as the teacher is concerned. We were all young once. We all started you know, at some point. So age doesn't really as matter that much, but as long as you are on the lookout for new ways and you are conscious about the kind of things I talked about, I think you know, that would prepare you to be a good teacher. Now, the three C approach in language teaching, that actually is based upon language learning. Now, here I'm talking about as a teacher, but why? But also if you learn, for instance, the three CA, the first C is a communicative approach. Now we all know in today's language teaching, wherever you go, whatever you talk about, task-based, the project-based, and so on and so forth, the purpose of language learning most of the time is about for communication. Right? And especially when we talk about the community of approach, we talk about probably more about oral communication than written. But with the COVID, with everything else, the written is there as well. You know, the kind of a, you know, devices, technological devices we use, we chat, WhatsApp, so on and so forth. So you can talk, but also you can chat each other by <coughs> typing things. So it, this has a lot of impact. But communication is the most important. And then when you talk about the communication, and you, you will see why... It, did we learn the language in a certain way? You know, grammar teaching is always important, but if you just simply teach it for the sake of learning about grammar, that's not about communicate, you know, communication. So grammar is important as long as your aim is there. So communication is number one. But as I said, the people I've been dealing with mostly are what we call the adult language learners, so 15 years above. I did you know, have some experience working with the people teaching younger ones, and with international school, we devised uh, a bilingual or bi yeah, bilingual education for people start from the age of three. So we teach this group, and it's very different because the their language or their linguistic development is in part or is on par at the same time as their cognitive development. So it's a very different way of language learning. But if you are adult language learner, you cannot you cannot learn without comparing. It's a fallacy. It's a completely, you know, force saying that you can just think in the language you are in tag language alone. We can't. We, you know, you just ask yourself. Yeah, we try, but it's can't. How do you understand it? Because adult learner, one of the characteristics is do not you do not learn if you don't understand. As a kid, you can remember a lot of things without really understanding it. If you ask me to remember something which I don't understand, you don't have a chance. Obviously, this is related to motivation as well. So why you are doing it? But most important thing is anal contrast and analysis. And that's based upon, obviously, the, lang the type of the language a person learn, also the language most familiar to the learner. So for instance, I'm Chinese. If I learn English, obviously I compare with Chinese. But once I have English, I start to learn another language. Not necessarily I'm going to compare with my Chinese. I may compare with other languages. So the root you know, if you look at the Latin based the languages, so, so when I learn French, and then I'm going to get on to Italian, I get to Spanish, and you actually do not compare with English, you compare with English more so you compare with French and, uh, uh, you know, the, the Latin ones. But that is how we learn, okay, how we learn, so the contrastive, and that, and that also points to the fact that not only how learner learn, but also how the teacher should approach the teaching. But if you just teach from your perspective, as the mother tongue speaker, without really understanding the needs or the problems of your learners, it is quite difficult to devise effective teaching approach. And finally, also in the kind of multilingual and multicultural environment is about the cultural awareness. Traditionally, we also talk about the cross-cultural communication skills, but as we all know, in European environment, we talk about more about the intercultural communications. So when you talk about intercultural communications, the culture and the culture, they're completely equal. There's no 
something like you know because I'm learning your language, I'm also learning your culture. So when I was learning English, we had to learn the history, we had to learn everything else. If you just think about Europe today, when the French mother tongue speaker talk to a German mother tongue speaker in English in the European working group, or the or the Italians, or you know the Spanish, you know you talk about this. Where is what we call the cross cultural communication skills? Do they need to know about、uh, you know the history and the blah blah of the UK or, or of America? They don't. They don't. So it is also a quite naive in a way to think that now UK is out of EU and the EU will not use English. You can forget that English doesn't only belong to the UK; it belongs to everybody who speaks it. And that requires the intercultural communication. That three C approach is pretty much came to me initially when I was helping、uh, with the training of English teachers from China, and I found that the problem you know the British teachers of English had when we're dealing with the people coming from you know a certain group of、uh, a certain group coming from a certain background, a cultural and linguistic background. Now, if you compare this, what we call the 对外汉语教学 you know, teaching Chinese to the speakers of other language, I always use the word in China because 对外 almost defines itself in a broad sense. You can say it's a teaching language to the speakers of other languages. It's in broad sense, but in a narrow sense, actually, you have this modification in China, and because in China, so you have this particular model called the 结构 which is of the structure. You have a 功能 which is fun. Function, which is about communication, and then you got about culture. Now, in that approach, Jiego obviously is the Chinese. You start with the Chinese, and then what you do, obviously, you learn it to use that function. But where do you use it? You use it in China. So you learn all about the things about the Chinese culture. In that environment, this approach has no problem at all, which is quite effective. But when you put it in a multilingual and multicultural environment, and then you would find some of the things. Do not really correspond because in the next in the you know this three typical 结构功能文化模式 you actually do not really need to know or you can't really learn the languages of all the participants who come from all parts of the world. It, they probably many of them still rely English, but what about the people whose mother tongue or who did not or who do not know English? So it's quite difficult in that kind of environment. Okay, so I'm going to jump to this one finally. Uh, While、well, I'm talking about teaching, but I think that the teaching is associated with learning. So the learning side is pretty much from my collaboration with my students, the learners I've been dealing with, as well as myself as a learner of languages. Okay, so for teaching wise, I think for teaching for teachers, the motivation is equally important. Why do we teach? Okay, why do we teach? And what really motivates you? To work as a language teacher, obviously it's a job, but there is more to just a job. Okay, so we talk about the teacher, and for a teacher, and the, it's just as Chinese say, know yourself. But the other one you need to know is know your learners. Obviously, you need to know your language, know the language you teach. But I think、uh, when we talk about the teaching grammar, when we talk about the teaching approach, the fundamental starting point. Is your learner? Is your learner? So once you understand this, you will find that the teaching will be more relevant because the working is quite. It can be only effective when it is relevant. You know that's what、uh, you know when we talk about the, the adult learners. You know when we are adult, we never learn something which is not useful. We are very practical. We are kind of instrumental. Okay, instrumental. And、uh, so the learning experience will determine, you know, how long you want to get on. So the teacher will be very. You have to really pay attention to, you know, how the students learn, how students feel about the learning with you, right? So we tend to teach, but for me, I think a language teacher, you need to really focus on three things. What? Well, basically, try to speak as less, you know, as little as possible. As precise and concise as possible, but to the point. But that's based upon, as I understand, as I said, the contrastive analysis. If you understand, especially the mother tongue or the language in our case would be English, you know, in, in the UK, the language everybody uses. If you understand the characters,、uh, characteristics and the difference and the similar similarities, and especially the culture and、uh, 
the cognition that underlines those differences, if you can really touch on that point, your explanation will be very sharp, very to the point. Most important thing, you should be a very wise Director, direct in the sense that you direct the direct the learning of your learners. It's almost like an orchestra; people playing different turn, you know instruments coming from different background. But you are there to make sure that that becomes a really a piece. Finally, the most important thing for the teacher: if you are a learner, you would full you will be full of empathy. Okay, if you are not, you always think you know why do you do this? Why this is so easy? Nothing is that easy or difficult in language learning. It's just how you do it, how you do it. So combined with experience, that's why encouragement is, in, you know, is quite impo important. This leads on to the learning side because the encouragement would actually help the learner to stay motivated. Obviously, as a learner, especially as conscious, anxious learner, you always have something, you know, you have seen something in mind when you start to learn something, you know, why, why do I need to learn the language? How many of the learners would actually aim to learn to speak another language just as fluent or as naturally as a native speaker? There are some, there are some, and including many of us, but if you think about the way we speak English, how many of us can speak English as a native do? Okay, so that's number one. Number two is, uh, you need to have a realistic and achievable goals. And they, they don't have to be long target, long term, but you do need to have a long term plus the short term. So for learning, that's very important. What do I need to achieve? If we want to be, you know, really fluent in the language, the way you do, and also the time you need it, you would have to learn more. But if you only want to achieve to a certain level, and then it becomes more realistic, you can put them into little chunks, uh, chunks. And uh, for language learning, because we are adult, normally I always find that it's useful to have a slight overview of what the language is about, because this is, again, you can trust, you, you know, you compare what this language is like, what the language, compared with the language we know. For, for instance, if you learn German, if you learn Japanese, if you learn Korean, you find that the verb always comes at the end, right? And uh, so in that way, you would find that you have to wait until that one, you know really what the action is about, and then, Compared with uh, like English and Chinese, some of them are the same with O S O uh, V O structure, but you find that the time and the place they are not the same at all. So they are always different. But you think about the why, and so once you have a general idea, you focus on the relevant bit. That would actually make learning very effective, rather than just accumulate the bit by bit. But every learner has especially adult, we all have our own different approach. That includes many things. You know, some, some people would get up early, some people get late, some people can focus for 20 minutes, some people can focus three hours. It's all different. Some people want to focus on vocabulary and so on and so forth. But most important thing is keep using the language. Okay, that's how you learn, how they learn. Oh, it's just the, the frequency. So it's not big chunks. It's just the lit by bit. Language learning is not going to happen or language comp competence is not going to happen or achieved overnight. You know, just it's a bit by bit. If you set a realistic goal, it's achievable. And uh, that obviously requires patience and persistence. We learned the language when we started, well, almost like when we were in the womb before we come out into this world. And it took us, you know, I just watching the little ones, including my granddaughter, you know, it took her a good about two years of silence to be able to really speak something so if you look at that one you know our students you know i had intensive course in one of the times 20 hours a week after 20 hours people can speak chinese for about 10 15 minutes about them self self-introduction that's a miracle that's a wonder that's a wonder it's achievable that's all i think uh, thanks hope for it is of some use but that's from my personal experience thank that's you that's excellent thank you so much professor Zhao. thank you so much for your sharing i think a lot of it is particularly helpful for any language teachers so we all benefit a lot through what you say but i think i can totally feel you're very sympathetic and also kind of focus on the learners you really reflect what you say being a teacher, being a learner, is actually happening at the same time. So I wanted to follow up with a couple of questions because one thing I thought you mentioned was really, really interesting is about expectation and setting realistic goals, right? So 
What kind of advice would you give to learners at different stages in terms of setting goals and having the right expectation? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know from the different kind of learners of Chinese, you know, I've been uh, I have encountered in a way you will find that most of the NR learners would have a very real uh, how would you say as I said instrumental aim. Some say I would be able to, for instance, uh, somebody is married into a Chinese family. Okay, either have you know, this one, or somebody probably work needed, or somebody will think about in the future they want to change. Yeah. And then you would ask yourself what level of Chinese you would like to get to in the end. Okay, so that's the number one. So that's why I said you set a realistic, set a kind of a long term goal. Now, if you want to read, to be able to read, or you want to speak, communicate quite frontally, but I will read certain things, but not really in your subject uh, area. And that's one way of doing it. And also, how much time you have got? Do you have an environment? That's very important. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> as an adult, as an adult learn a language learner, we are constrained by many things. But compared with, you know, I personally do not agree that we learn like a kid. I don't because we learn far more effectively, efficiently, as long as we know why and how. And so, this is why we would be able to achieve uh, language learning. If you think about uh, uh, the kind of uh, hours and hours are needed for learning a language to a particular level at the European languages all have this kind of uh, uh, reference and numbers. For instance, uh, if you look at the Cambridge exam board, if you are a European language speaker, you learn, you want to learn English, you can achieve English to kind of A2 level and in about 180 to 20, 200 hours. That's kind of, a, you know, kind of a reference number of hours you need to be able to achieve this one. But European language is different from Chinese in a way that most of the times, if you're able to speak, you also learn how to read and write yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. English is no good. You know, English is a very phonetically is not good at all. If you look at the Leicester Square, uh -huh. you know, it doesn't really read, you know, pronounce as it reads. If you think about Leicester Square, it's not Leicester Square, right? It's a Leicester Square. French is no good either because the French omit a lot of sounds, as you know. But if you come to, you know, other Latin language, if you come to Italian, Spanish, they just, you know, write and they look exactly the same way as you speak. The Chinese, as we know, this is different, but it is quite easy. I've had a student. I've had a, I had a student before who speaks seven languages. Wow! And he told me. Chinese is the easiest one to learn with regard to just oral communication. That's very encouraging for all our yeah. students. <laughs> just now, it is possible to get someone to be able to communicate mm. at kind of a basic level in an intensive course. 20 hours, you know, for a week, you know, just you say four hours a day, 20 hours, you cover a lot. Mm. You cover a lot. You can do a lot of things in terms of or communication. Obviously, how to retain this, this is a completely different thing. This is why I said you need to be patient, but it is quite important and quite possible. Now, if you think about other European languages, tell me which one you can do. Just the verbal conjugation would get you off. You know, <laughs> how to, con you know, just just to conjugate a verb in today, tomorrow, and yesterday. And it just takes so much at the very beginning. The Chinese is very easy. But... In terms of reading and the writing, Chinese is completely the other way around, right? Mm -hmm. It takes much longer for you to get it. But once you understand how the Chinese characters are structured, and once you know the different components and you know the logic, actually it becomes very easy afterwards. Mm. Yeah, it's the front load, which is very heavy. Then it depends on how you're going to develop or devise approach to assist people. So I had people who only want to learn to communicate orally, but you can actually put a bit of Chinese in it. And actually at the end of the day, they developed really kind of a huge interest in Chinese written language of the characters. Why? Because it is so different yeah. from whatever they've had. Yeah. But if you want to be able to read the Chinese so very effectively, that's going to take quite a long time. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you have to, that's why I said you have to be, first of all, know what you want to achieve, and then you can set realist time. But then you can set and say, within one month or within three months, I can achieve yeah. a certain level and so on and so forth. Certainly, verbal speaking, you can achieve a lot. 
Great. That, that's very encouraging. <laughs> and the other thing, because you, you talk about being adult learners, right? And the kind of a contrastive analysis, it just happened automatically in your head. For example, if you're native English speakers, you tend to, you you subconsciously compare Chinese with English. So what would be your advice? How can learners to take advantage of mm. that kind of, you know, unconscious comparison? Is there any danger or, you know, I'm more interested in how can they, you know, take advantage, but if, if there's anything that they need to avoid, um, please share as well. I think that there's been a lot of research on this. So we talk about when you're learning language, you talk about the, you know, the, the positive and then negative transfer. Okay. Mm, yeah. I think the danger is that you try, you, people as an adult, we tend to overgeneralize. So you learn a couple of things, you say everything's the same, but we always tend to use the language we're familiar with into the target language. Yeah, structure-wise, you know, conjugation, or whatever you talk about. And uh, so this is where I said, even subconscious use, but this is actually a useful strategy we all use. Obviously it has its danger, which is what the teacher need to be, you know, kind of uh, aware of. And if you do not know the language of the other person, you're not really, you know, conscious of those kind of problems. And the 3C approach is very much a kind of was devised based upon the difference between the Chinese and the English, in including the book you mentioned, the Chinese Seeing Steps. Mm -hmm. It was really founded on this principle. But this actually came from kind of a long tradition. So I started as a teacher of English. So my specialization before was helping the Chinese learn English because, you know, my own experience, I said, you know, the English learning shouldn't be that kind of painful, should be far more effective. And then we also come to the other side, just the helping the English speakers to learn Chinese, exactly the same thing. It just they flip the coin around, flip the coin around. They always compare. But if you look at uh, the tradition in SOAS, you mentioned about where I work. So if you look at, uh, you know, the textbooks, first the textbook divide, the, the lingua from Chinese divided by Laoshe and a colleague. It's already Chinese and uh, English native speaker work together. When it comes to the second generation, the Kuruko Chinese by Tuna Pollard, and it's a similar thing. It's between the Chinese and the English. And then, you know, the Chinese in steps is really devised for people who's, who are not really learning Chinese as a major or learning as elective or learning in their spare time. So it's not that intensive in, ter in terms of the content, but it actually, the grammar is buried in the speech patterns. There's no formal teaching of grammar at all, but it's all based upon the differences between the two languages. So the difference is far more important in a way. For yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. We, we must get the link of the book to all the friends in the Zig Espresso so people can also access. I think one of the things you mentioned about uh, people can use it to learn in their spare time, that would be great. I think that would be really, really beneficial. And I think my final question is more about, I'm really fascinated when you talk about this cultural awareness and particularly cultural awareness in a multilingual, multicultural setting, which is really interesting because of course, nowadays we teach students to learn Mandarin Chinese. But China itself is multilingual, multicultural. We have different dialects. We have North, South, and you know, different region might have their own culture. How, how would you um, teach students or what kind of advice you give students who want to know Chinese culture? Is there such a thing about Chinese culture? How do they learn? <laughs> it's interesting you raise this. It is uh, uh, quite a challenge to be honest. And uh, as, you, as you said, Chinese culture itself is a very rich, very kind of, it includes a lot of varieties. So that's why there, there are always a kind of a discussion and a dispute about, for instance, whether the, all the Chinese eat uh, jiaozi at the spring festival. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, I never, I'm from Shanghai. Absolutely, you know, don't. The people from the South don't. And, <laughs> no. uh, yeah, but, but we tend to, I think, uh, uh, define the, the word culture in a kind of very narrow sense, in a narrow sense. Uh, culture is everywhere, and uh, in fact, uh, the Chinese language itself is full of culture. And uh, you know, I've talked about uh, this in many other ways because of the approach we take in the contrast contrasted analysis, and uh, the language itself, in many ways, reflects the way why we are Chinese. Okay, so from you know the phonetic to the word to the characters to you know uh, the structure to even 
we, we call it the discourse. So if you analyze each layer of them, they are full of cultures. But mm -hmm. it is all this. Then obviously people use the language in the very different ways in the different areas. They also add their local flavor. So that's where why the Chinese language itself and the culture is quite rich as well. When Chinese becomes an international language, which means it's going to be really owned by people from all parts of the world, hopefully. And then you would find that they'll be even richer. So that's why we need to learn something associated with it, but you can't really confine yourself. This is just it, it's not. So that's why awareness is far more important just mm. the culture itself. Okay, okay. I, I know I said that was my last question, but <laughs> because you are so experienced and also you shared a lot about um, advice to teachers actually in, in your initial talk. So if I may, um, mm. what else the language teachers should be aware of or develop, you know, if they think teaching Chinese as a profession? Because I think we, we will all, you know, benefit a lot from your experience and advice. So can you just uh, share a little bit, if, so what Chinese teachers sh can do or should do to develop themselves professionally? Uh, uh, well, I think in, in a way, uh, I would probably find myself repeating myself. And <laughs> I think at the very beginning, uh, the, the first slides are pretty much, I think, you know, I focused on those kind of thing. Uh, to, to, to have some language learning experience, when I started the language teach, Chinese language teaching training programs in SOAS, and uh, normally the first lesson we had for the people on the course was to learn a language that is new to you. Normally it would be an African language that people never heard of. Why? That experience hopefully would help you to reflect the way you teach others when you actually become a teacher you know, enter into the classroom. So you need kind of experience so that you would have the empathy and the kind of understanding what the language and learning is about. As I said, and the uh, age and experience, and the experience is important, but it's accumulative. So in a way, you don't need to be worried too much. In fact, uh, very, you know, age or being young is an advantage because you know, young people nowadays learn things far faster than you know of my age. You know, when it comes to technology, for instance. And, uh, but as long as you have this kind of uh, awareness and also being reflective, so constant on the way of learning, one of the important things I would probably advise uh, uh, teachers as well as the learners, the things that I really think is most important is about the ability to learn. That is social with the ability to reflect. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if you actually, if you think about what we call the transferable skills, what is the transferable skills? The most important thing is even in the university, whatever you teach in the university is only a foundation. It's only a very tiny bit of what you are gonna use in the real life. What really benefits you is about the ability, about the ability to learn, to solve problems. Mm, mm, problems. Mm, mm. It's the same thing in the language. Okay, as a language teacher, you learn, solve the problems when you learn language. I need to, I, I deal with this problem kind of all the time, how to remember the words, I can't remember them, how can I use this and all this. So you see where the problem is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and then this is your learning, but also you have the learners. Why would he or she had this problem? You know, what, what, were the what, what are the causes? And those kind of quests and the reflection will lead what we call action-based research. So research is not all theoretical. It's actually quite, you know, practice-based. So as long as you're aware, then you would be looking for the ways you know, how to approach that kind of research, how to do this, and the collaboration, as I also mentioned. Nowadays, it's very difficult for you to do things in the silo, and your program, for, for example, is example to help people to work together. So actually, we do not, we'll probably not meet in person, but we actually collaborate, we learn from each other, we exchange experience. Not all of them are useful, but hopefully some of them will be of some kind of you know, <laughs> you're being too modest. It's been really, really useful. And I think it's not only useful to the audience who are student learners, Chinese learners, but also teachers. So thank you so much, George, for your time today and for your advice. No problem. Okay. It's a great pleasure to be here and I wish your program go very well. Thank you. Great. And, and thank you guys for watching. I hope you really learned a lot from today's interview, today's talk, and see you next time. Bye.